This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Strong gains. The major indexes close out the first quarter at lofty levels. Now, investors trying to figure out what's next and what to do about it. Betting on the banks. Their stocks have had a slow start this year, but our market monitor says this sector has a lot going for it. Tonight, three names he says you should own. Privacy protections. You browse the web or click on an app. New legislation may free your internet provider to mine your data and sell it. What you can do to protect yourself. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for the last day of the first quarter, March 31st. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Tyler Matheson. Sue Herrera has the evening off. Well, weekend, month end, quarter end, and what a three months it was. The Dow turned in its sixth straight positive quarter for the first time since way back in 2006. The Nasdaq had its best quarterly performance since 2013, and the S&P 500 saw its biggest quarterly gain since 2015. Here, for the record, are the final numbers. For the first three months of 2017, the Nasdaq rallied the most, up 10%. Those gains came despite today's pullback. The Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 65 points to 20,663. The S&P 500 fell five, and the Nasdaq was off two and three-fifths. So what drove the gains in this quarter, and which sectors did better than others? Dominic Chu has some surprises among the first quarter winners and sinners. If you had stocks as part of your portfolio in the first quarter of 2017, you have to be feeling pretty good, at least so far. During the first three months of the year, we saw record high levels for not just the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ Composite, but also the S&P 400 Mid-Cap Index and the Russell 2000 Small Cap Index as well. There were a lot of reasons for the optimism. We saw a great quarter for U.S. stocks, up nearly 6% quarter to date. And this is really based on factors. The first is that the U.S. economy continues chugging along. The second is that the global economy is finally picking up. And the third is that U.S. company earnings um, are back to being in positive territory. The first quarter rally was relatively broad-based, with 9 out of 11 sectors in the S&P 500 in positive territory. Technology stocks like Apple and Facebook were among the best performers, and energy stocks like ExxonMobil and Chevron were among the big laggards. As for whether or not the market can continue, some experts believe it will come down to what happens with President Trump and Congress. There's been a lot of speculation about the potential benefits of deregulation in terms of across a lot of different sectors, including the financial sector. But I also believe that at the end of the day, investors are going to react to actual action. And so we'll have to see how the year progresses in terms of tax reform or regulatory reform um, across different industries and see whether or not it does in fact provide the benefits that everyone's expecting. After failing to achieve an overhaul of health care legislation, a a lot of focus now falls to the idea of tax reform, which some think could be even more difficult to achieve. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. Well, the new darling of Wall Street may be exchange-traded funds, or ETFs. Investors plowed money into these investment vehicles, which saw their biggest quarter for inflows ever. Bob Pisani has the details. The first quarter is in the books, and it's been a solid one overall, with the S&P up about 5%. But the bigger story is money continuing to flow into stocks. ETFs have had their biggest quarter ever with $135 billion in inflows. Investors wanted stocks from all over the world. That's the story for the first quarter. Nearly half of the inflows were into U.S. equities, but international funds also had strong inflows, particularly into Europe and into emerging markets. The big ETF winners were just plain vanilla S&P 500 index funds like the SPY, but we also saw emerging market ETFs and European ETFs do well, as I mentioned. Now, there weren't a lot of losers, but high-yield ETFs like the HYG saw significant outflows, about $1 billion in that particular fund. That's about 5% of the assets under management. What's going on? This is all about confidence. Confidence in the economy. Consumer confidence, for example, is at the highest level since 2000. I know some skeptics have noted that the harder economic numbers have not seen the big jump this quarter that sentiment indicators like consumer sentiment have seen, but confidence is still high in the economy. Then we have confidence in earnings. 
First quarter earnings are tracking up roughly 10%. This would be the best showing in nearly six years. And finally, confidence in the Trump agenda of lower taxes, infrastructure spending, and fewer regulations. Now, the rest of the year will be about the tension among those three factors. Can these incredible flows into the market continue? Well, it's pretty clear the Trump agenda can influence fund flows. For example, the third week in March, that was the first negative week since the election. And that was the week that the House failed on its Obamacare repeal bill. So the Trump agenda definitely influences sentiment and flows. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. So the first quarter is history. Let's get some advice on what to do in the next with Brian Levitt. He's a senior investment strategist with Oppenheimer Funds. Brian, welcome. Good to have you with us. I assume you just heard uh, uh, Bob's piece there. I can, did. can the stock market in the U.S. continue to make headway if the Trump agenda gets bogged down? Well, I think that the equity markets can continue to go higher. I believe that we are in a secular bull market so that returns are likely to be more modest and the composition of returns are likely to change, favoring more growth stocks than value stocks. In order for equities to go significantly higher from here, you probably do need some carry through with regards to policy. And I would say that would take the form at either the Federal Reserve backing off um, with regards to significant hikes in interest rates or fiscal stimulus uh, from the administration and Congress. The fundamentals look pretty good. I mean, Bob talked about measures of confidence, which he characterized as sort of soft measures. We need to see better earnings. What do you expect from corporate profits in the first quarter when they start getting reported in a couple of weeks? And as you look out across the year, what do you expect? So corporate earnings should continue to grind higher. And if you remember, uh, last year at this time, we had had a significant rally in the U.S. dollar on the back of Fed tightening at the, at the end of 2015. And that significant rally in the U.S. dollar was a headwind to corporate profitability and some talk of an earnings recession. We now have companies that are beating expectations. The dollar has, are going to beat expectations. The dollar has stabilized. The economy has improved since the summer. And so earnings are likely to continue to go higher. Um, again, we don't expect lights out economic activity without a policy driver, but the earnings environment for corporations continues to look sound. So where can I put some money now? Let me, let me suggest that I get my big tax refund in the next <laughs> couple of weeks and I've got some spare cash to put to work. Where would you recommend I do it? Well, the first thing is investors should consider um, allocations even outside the United States. I mean, outside the United States, expectations are lower with regards to what type of policy stimulus you're going to get. So if you were to look in Europe, if you were to look in the emerging markets, those parts of the world are actually in very nice parts of the economic cycle as the emerging markets recover and as Europe expands. So good opportunities exist there, valuations that look reasonable. Within the United States, um, we continue to like the loan market. We think credit will continue to be uh, continue to perform well, and I would say that you know for everybody that got very excited about value and all the value names that were going to do well in a cyclical upturn, I think we're more in a growth environment as we continue to be in a in a reasonably slow growth uh, U.S. backdrop. How about volatility? It has been one of the lowest quarters ever for the so-called VIX or the fear gauge. You expect that to pick up? Yeah, I would think that you will see volatility pick up. Um, and, and investors should always expect, even in a long-term bull market, which I believe that we're in, you're going to see bouts of volatility. You will see you know, market corrections at some point. We have them every year, uh, greater than 5% correction in every year mm -hmm. over the last 35 years. So you will see volatility pick up. I think the most important thing for investors is to not allow themselves to get whipsawed or right. to be too focused on um, you know, near-term events uh, to prevent them from I'm sticking right. to a long-term plan. We'll leave it there, Brian. Thanks very much. Have a great Thank weekend. You. Brian Levitt with Oppenheimer Funds. Well, we told you uh, how the housing market has been faring this year. Prices up as inventory remains tight. But what about the rental market? As a growing number of young Americans move out on their own, the rental apartment market is seeing strong demand. But developers may have overestimated just how much supply the market needs. Diana Olick takes a look at how developers fared in the first quarter and what that means for renters. If you're a first time renter or looking to upgrade to a bigger, newer apartment, now may be your best chance. Demand for rental apartments fell short of new supply by about 100,000 units nationwide, according to RealPage, a real estate analytics firm. Rent growth is also easing. 
you can actually get a good deal this year if you're looking to move into one of those brand new properties. A month free, you might get your first month free. In fact, in some places you might get your first two months free uh, once you move into some of these new buildings. The key is brand new. Luxury buildings are seeing the most new supply and are therefore moving to more concessions. Total apartment occupancy is still high, but it is weakening and has been for the past six months. Cities seeing the biggest downturn, New York and Boston. That's where REITs like Avalon Bay and Equity Residential are the most vulnerable, but their stocks are still doing well thanks to the recent market rally and the possibility of deregulation, which would benefit them. Apartment demand and rents are strongest on the West Coast, where REITs like Essex Property Trust and UDR have major holdings. Multifamily overall is still strong, but the new supply coming online this year, especially in major cities, outpaces demand by a lot. Practically every market, you are going to see softer growth in the urban core. And if we were looking for places where concessions are going to be up and rent growth could potentially be negative, they would be urban core locations across the U.S. Apartment developers are already moving more toward the suburbs where demand outpaces supply and the rental stock is much older. That's where they're likely to see the greatest returns, especially as the supply of newly built single family homes lags. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. Still ahead, project derailed. What's at stake for one of America's busiest train corridors if Amtrak doesn't get the money it says it needs? Remember all of those bonds that the Fed bought to juice the economy? Well, as the economy improves and interest rates rise, investors want to know what the central bank wants to do, plans to do with them. And today, a prominent Fed official may have hinted at the answer. New York Fed President Bill Dudley said it wouldn't surprise him if instead of selling them, the Fed may let the securities mature and roll off the bank's balance sheet. That's important to investors because letting those bonds go back into the market would increase supply and with it, interest rates. Well, one gauge of inflation has hit the Fed's target. According to the Commerce Department, the rate of inflation in consumer goods and services topped 2% for the first time in nearly five years. The inflation measure is part of the monthly personal income and spending report. Personal spending showed a small gain, while incomes were basically in line with expectations. Well, President Trump wants his administration to review U.S. trade deficits and wants to take a tough stance with countries that abuse trade rules. He signed two executive orders today that he says will start a new chapter for workers and business and set the stage for a revival of American manufacturing. The theft of American prosperity will end. We're going to defend our industry and create a level playing field for the American worker, finally. Today, I am signing two executive orders that send this message loud and clear. The first executive order reviews U.S. trade deficits with other countries. The second strengthens the government's ability to collect fines for abusive trade practices. Well, infrastructure spending is also high on the Trump administration's agenda. And as Morgan Brennan reports from Newark, New Jersey, Amtrak has a lot at stake if it doesn't get the funding it says it needs. Every day, 240 trains carrying 200,000 commuters pass through a 106-year-old tunnel under the Hudson River. The two-lane tunnel, damaged by Superstorm Sandy, is actually cracking. It's among the most pressing infrastructure projects in America right now. What that will do is start to build the redundancy, uh, four tracks instead of two, to allow uh, commuters and intercity passenger uh, rail passengers to get into New York and get onto Boston and, and Washington. The $24 billion gateway plan has been years in the making. Amtrak, New Jersey Transit, the Port Authority and lawmakers like New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez have been urging the federal government to provide the investment it pledged to begin work, starting with a bridge replacement, which could begin right away. The federal government needs to put up its share. I'm happy to consider infrastructure uh, investment as an element of that, but I don't want to wait for that because I don't know how long that's going to take. And every day that we wait in moving forward on the tunnel development, it gets more costly. 
costly. With this year's federal budget still in flux and President Trump unveiling a 2018 blueprint that would eliminate a future source of funding, Gateway is on the line. And with it, productivity in a region comprising 10 percent of America's economy. There's no other way to, to accommodate uh, th those 200,000 people a day. It would have a very direct and very dire impact. It could literally trigger a recession regionally all by itself. If that funding doesn't materialize or even if it's delayed, the existing tunnel will have to come offline one track at a time within the next decade. A scenario that would reduce service from 24 trains an hour down to six, creating rail bottlenecks from Washington, D.C. as far north as Boston. Amtrak estimates that could result in the loss of up to $3 billion in economic activity from 2025 to 2029. But if the project does move forward on schedule, Gateway would generate $4 for every one spent. Experts say the existing infrastructure won't last more than two decades. And with passenger volume only expected to grow, the clock is ticking. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan in Newark, New Jersey. BlackBerry's turnaround efforts may be becoming fruitful, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. The software and smartphone company beat expectations and said it benefited from an increase in enterprise customers and stronger software sales. BlackBerry tra transitioning from smartphones into a software company. It also said it expects to be profitable sometime in fiscal 2018. Investors like what they heard and sent shares up more than 11 percent to $7.75. Accorda Therapeutics said it lost a ruling on four of its patents for multiple sclerosis treatment. The biotech company said it is disappointed, plans to appeal the ruling. Accorda shares down 21 percent on that news to $21 even. DuPont will sell a piece of its crop protection business to rival FMC and also will buy the majority of FMC's health and nutrition unit. DuPont said the deal will help it win approval from the European Commission for its proposed takeover of Dow Chemical. It also set back the closing date uh, for that deal a third time. FMC shares popped 13 percent to 69.59. DuPont down 1 percent at 80.33. CVS Health says its contract with the health insurer Blue Cross and Blue Shield to provide specialty pharmacy services will expire at the end of this year. The retail pharmacy said that the contract loss will not affect the company's 2017 financial results. But shares still fell slightly. They were off a fraction at 78.50. Verizon reportedly is preparing to launch a new live TV streaming service. Bloomberg says the telecom giant is working with content owners to secure licenses so it can offer an online platform where customers can access dozens of channels. Verizon shares fell fractionally to $48.75. And now to our market monitor who is betting that slowly rising interest rates and the potential for tax reform will benefit bank stocks. This is his first time joining us on the program and we welcome him now. Ryan Kelly, portfolio manager at the Hennessy Funds. Ryan, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Banks haven't had the best start uh, to the year, neither the big ones nor the smaller ones. What do you think is going to turn it for them? Well, I think it's just a matter of time. Right now, it's all about rates. And when interest rates rise, these banks go up. And when they go down, uh, we see a sell-off in the sector. But overall, I think that the sector remains uh, positive. We're looking for a good economy with slow and stable rising rates. That should help earnings. That'll help these stocks go up over time. Uh, icing on the cake will be any sort of tax reform or regulatory relief, which should help these companies as well. All right, let's get we also think that there will be a, a lot more uh, M&A activity as well. Fantastic. Let's get to a couple of your picks. You've got a large, a mid, and a small cap. Let's start with one nobody's heard of, uh, Bank of America. Why do you like it? <laughs> yes, Bank of America, we like this company. It's obviously a banking bellwether. Uh, it's the largest bank in the U.S. by deposits. Uh, this is a company that came out of the financial crisis and had to do a lot of uh, restructuring and cost cutting, and have done a very good job of that. Uh, it's one of the cheapest of the bank names, and primarily that's the reason why we like it. It's one of the largest uh, holdings in our large cap financial fund. Let's move on to Eagle Bank Corps, which you call a, a small mid cap uh, community bank in Bethesda, Maryland. Why that one? Yes, that's a, a bank that's in a very attractive market area. This is a typical company that we have in our Hennessy small cap financial fund. It's a well-run bank with a good management team. Uh, they're in an attractive market. 
Uh, it's an efficient operator, meaning that uh, they keep their costs low. And because of that, it has much higher than peer uh, returns and profitability. How does, a bank uh, like Eagle, little... how does a bank like Eagle in Bethesda, which is a small bank in a big metropolitan area, compete with the titans like B of A or Chase or TD? Well, that's the great thing about the small cap banking sector is that uh, while there are some economies of scale, it comes down to the local market. Mm -hmm. It's having uh, lenders who know their customers, uh, who have long-term relationships, and continue to, uh, to, to, to build the business that way. Basic blocking and tackling in the banking world. And Bank United exactly. is your third and final choice. Tell us about that one briefly. This is a very fast-growing bank. It's based in, uh, in Florida, Bank United. It's the largest bank headquartered in Florida. Uh, it's growing uh, about 17% last year in assets, so that's quite faster than the market. And yet it's trading at about a three multiple discount to its peers. So we think this is an attractive place to own this company. Ryan, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Ryan Kelly, Hennessy Funds. And coming up, protecting your privacy. How much information does your internet service provider have about you? The answer is a lot. Here's a look at what to watch next week. On Monday, the major automakers will release their monthly sales numbers. Wednesday, the Federal Reserve releases the minutes of its last meeting. That's where policymakers voted to increase interest rates. And on Friday, the monthly employment report for March will be released. And that is what to watch in a busy next week. Well, streaming music services were for the first time ever responsible for more than half of all music industry revenue last year. According to the Recording Industry Association of America, paid and ad-supported streaming brought in nearly $4 billion in 2015. It accounted for a little more than one-third of annual revenue. Much of the increase can be attributed to the growth of services like Spotify and Apple Music. Well, we told you earlier this week that the House of Representatives have voted to overturn privacy protection rules for consumers, a measure that President Trump is expected to sign. The new legislation would let Internet providers closely monitor their customers' browsing habits and then even sell that information without permission. Here to discuss what this means to you and how you can protect yourself is Laura Moy. She's the deputy director of the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law School. Laura, do I have it right? Uh, this uh, legislation, which as I understand it, has not yet sort of moved through and been signed into law, would do that and it would allow inter internet service providers, Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, and others to mine my data and sell it. So you're right. The, what, what this does is it allows internet service providers, or I should say it eliminates the rules that would prevent internet service providers from using or selling information about their customers without permission. So most Americans, if they're connected to the internet, pay a monthly service fee to an internet provider. That's a company like Comcast, AT&T, or Verizon that provides them in exchange with an internet connection. Because they provide that connection, your internet provider gets a window into pretty much everything that you do online with that connection. So today, do mm -hmm. I have to sign some sort of waiver uh, mm -hmm. that, that would allow them then to mine my data and sell it, or do they just <laughs> right. they just don't have that right at all? So what the rule would do, would have done, what the rules that we had in place would do, is they would require internet providers to to get your permission before they use that information mm -hmm. for purposes other than to provide service. And that's just to be clear here, we're talking about browsing history, we're talking about right. app usage history, we're talking about websites that you might visit to look up medical conditions, websites that you might visit that express your political viewpoint. We're talking about if you visit Planned Parenthood's website or the NRA's website. We're talking about if you use dating apps or 
uh, weight loss apps. This is all information that an internet provider has about its customers and can make a lot of inferences about their customers private and information. Uh, from, uh, with apologies, mm -hmm. it's the family hour here, but I assume that would collect uh, information if people were using it to uh, look at illicit or pornographic websites as well. <laughs> yes, that is that is absolutely true. And, and, and one thing that I think concerns a lot of folks is that browsing history and app usage history can, of course, um, it can of course tell an internet provider or another entity right. a lot of information about one's sexual so, preferences or romantic preferences. So is there anything I can do if this uh, becomes the law mm -hmm. of the land as it appears it will? Is there anything that I can do to insulate myself from this? Uh, so if I'm just, uncomfortable. So just to be clear here, yeah, the vast majority of Americans want more privacy protection, not less. And unfortunately, the best thing to protect our privacy online would be strong rules. And if President Trump does sign this, as he's expected to, then we won't have those rules. What you can do, uh, you can look into some other options if you can afford to pay an extra monthly fee for a virtual private network. Uh, if you have the technical savvy to do mm -hmm. that, and uh, and if you're willing to download some free privacy, some free browser extensions, those are some things that can help your right. uh, help increase your privacy. But unfortunately, it's not as good as having strong rules. Laura, thanks very much. We appreciate it. Laura Thank Moy you. with appreciate Georgetown's it. Law School. Thanks so much. And that will do it for this edition of Nightly Business Report. Thanks for watching. I'm Tyler Matheson. Have a great weekend, and we will see you Monday.